A warm welcome to the cultural center La Prairie in Belmont in Switzerland. I just finished the recording of three Beethoven sonatas here at this wonderful little venue. It's part seven of the A Tempo project and in a way it marks a new step within my big A Tempo project. In the first volumes of this A Tempo project, we particularly focused on metronome markings. We did that to a great extent with the first Beethoven recording. We also did it with Schumann's C major fantasy, as well as Chopin's Etudes, Opus 10. We learned that there are alternative ways to understand questionably fast metronome markings in the 19th century, that would make the resulting tempo twice as slow. We also talked about pros and cons of such a scenario, and we learned that the likelihood of slow metronome markings is limited. However, it can be seen in the historical context. We also discussed documented durations of actual performances in the 19th century. The most spectacular example perhaps for that is Franz Liszt's great fantasy and fugue on At Nos At Salutarim Undam for organ, which I recorded as volume two of the A Tempo project. Here we find a difference between the documented duration and an average interpretation today of more than 15 minutes. Another example with Liszt as well is Beethoven's great Hammerklavier Sonata, Opus 106. For this work, uh, Liszt gives uh, a duration of the piece, and if we compare, compare that duration with the duration resulting from Beethoven's own metronome markings, we find a difference of more than 20 minutes. So, one thing is sure, the phenomenon of slowness exists in the 19th century. There are also documents showing fast playing, very much like today, but alongside that there is the phenomenon of slowness. We particularly learned that Franz Liszt and his ideas of interpretation of Beethoven symphonies are a wonderful example for such a slower approach to music. I talked about that in my book about Franz Liszt's At Nos Fantasy, which came out in 2021. It's in German, but for those of you who understand German, it still might be of interest. There is an entire chapter about Liszt and Beethoven, and you will find many quotes, many reviews that show that a phenomenon of slowness in Liszt's interpretation. This leads us to going one step further and to ask a very important question. Why did Franz Liszt perform his at nose fantasy so slowly? Why did he perform Beethoven's Hammerklavier Sonata so slowly? What are the benefits of a slower approach to classical music? This is a musical question and it is entirely independent from right or wrong in the historical context. It is the question for me as a performer, why do I find it better, nicer, more appropriate, cooler, when I play pieces more slowly? This is the main question of this uh, volume 7 of the Atempo project. I recorded three sonatas by Ludwig van Beethoven as volume 7 of the A Tempo project. It's the sonata in C minor, opus 13, also named Pathetic. It's the sonata in C sharp minor, opus 27, number 2, also called the Moonlight Sonata. And the lovely E minor sonata, opus 90. I used 
this instrument. It's an Erar concert grand piano. If you look at the series number, we see that it was built in 1839. It's a big concert grand piano. And it was rebuilt in the 1870s or 1880s, just to adapt the instrument to the taste of that time. I asked our piano technician, Mr. Urs Bachmann, to give us an account of the character of this instrument and to talk a little bit about its history. Wir stehen hier vor einem wunderschönen Erar-Flügel. Erar Paris, der wurde 1839 gebaut. Ein Instrument, was erstaunlich fortgeschrittlich ist für diese Zeit. Es ist so oder so ein außergewöhnliches Instrument, außergewöhnlich verarbeitet, wenn man zum Beispiel hier auf der Seite sieht, diese Messing ein Lagen, das ist sehr aufwendig, das zu machen und das Instrument ist reich verziert, auch hier die Beine überall, wunder, wunderschöne Arbeit. Das äh, Instrument war sicherlich ein, eines der teuren Modelle seiner Zeit. Äh, er war ein Wegbereiter im Klavierbau, hat zum Beispiel, hier drinnen sieht man das bereits 1839, diese Metall, diese Eisenstreben eingebaut, die sind dazu da, die Seitenspannung zu halten. Das Instrument ist weitestgehend drei seitig Proton bezogen, hat natürlich durch das auch deutlich mehr Spannung drauf. Das sind Stahlseiten und die werden von diesen Eisenträgern werden die gehalten. Dazu hat er äh, kurz bevor das Instrument gebaut wurde, für das Spielwerk ein Patent angemeldet, einen Doppelrepetitionsmechanismus. Das ist diese Art von Spielwerk, was heute in jedem Flügel äh, verwendet wird, er hat seine Erfindung von Erar. Des Weiteren hat dieses Instrument zusätzlich zum Resonanzboden, der unter den Seiten liegt, hier einen Resonanzboden, den man speziell runter lassen kann als zweiten Resonanzboden, der dann nur durch die Seitenschwingung nicht über die Körperschallübertragung in Schwingung gebracht wird und der ist auch die Idee dieses zusätzlichen Resonanzbodens, dass es helfen sollte, den Klang noch zu vergrößern. In Tat und Wahrheit ist es aber so, durch dass die Seiten abgedeckt werden, hilft es vielleicht im unteren Bereich mit den kräftigen Schwingungen, mag es etwas helfen, im oberen Bereich, wo so oder so das schon eher etwas schwach ist, ist es eher negativ, da deckt es die Seiten zu und der Klang wird eher ein bisschen schwächer. Und darum kann man das auch hier hochgeben und dann kann es so etwas helfen, noch den, den Klang zu verbessern. We'll now go through the pieces and movements and examine some aspects of tempo and interpretation in these three Beethoven sonatas. I would like, like to start with the Moonlight Sonata. There are quite many records and documents talking about Liszt's playing of uh, that piece. He was famous for giving a sublime rendition of the Moonlight Sonata. And we find quite a lot of that information in this book, Erinnerungen an Franz Liszt by August Stradal. Stradal was a pupil uh, of Liszt in his late years and spent a lot of time with Liszt. And here he talks about everyday, everyday life, but also about interpretation, and particularly about the Moonlight Sonata. I would like to start uh, with the first movement. And here it's something very interesting about rhythm. 
The accompaniment uh, consists of uh, triple eighth notes. And then the famous melody comes in, which is not triplets, but a regular dotted eighth note and a sixteenth note. So we have like two uh, different kinds of rhythms uh, at the same time. If I play that like it's written, it would sound like that. Stradal now says that Liszt didn't play it that way, but he sort of made the last 16th note a little longer, so that, as a result, it almost sounded like a triple eighth note. And also, as a result of that, there is some sort of short hesitation at the end of every bar that sounds like this. I just love the effect of that little uh, change of rhythm. It adds so much poetry to this piece. It's really very, very wonderful, I think, and inspiring. As for the tempo, I uh, chose a tempo that allows to hear the melody, which is very slow, um, but still is uh, slow as an entire piece. Now the third movement, uh, the, the second movement, the Allegretto. Here uh, we find this uh, motif at the beginning. We have leg legato for the uh, first three notes, followed by staccato. Stradal says here that Liszt didn't play that too short, so he sort of made uh, the staccati più dolce, more soft, uh, which sounds probably something like that. So it's quite a big difference to this. It's, it's very much like soft and sing, almost singing even in the staccato figures, something I find very, very nice. There is also something very uh, interesting for the third movement, the presto agitato. Here we have the 16th notes, uh, which are in piano, followed by, the, by those two eighth notes, which are a sforzato, so loud and with an accent on it. Uh, Beethoven also says that there is no pedal for the 16th notes, but pedal for uh, the, the two eighth notes up here. So if I play it just that way, then as a result, I get quite a big contrast between the 16th notes and the eighth notes like this. Now, Stradal says that Franz Liszt didn't play it that way, but he wanted his pupils to start very piano, like almost pianissimo, and perform a crescendo up to the sforzato and leave the pedal until the beginning of the next bar. That sounds like this. I think it, um, the grandeur of this piece increases by that. It's, it's a, more of a grand character, which is very, very nice uh, for that wonderful movement. As for the tempo, I clearly play it more slowly uh, than usual because I think that I can add more energy to those 16th notes when I have a chance to actually perform every single one of them. So the intensity, also the agitation 
um, after peace increases. All right, so let's move on to the Pathetic, Opus 13. I would like to make two remarks about uh, that sonata. The first one is about the first movement. Uh, more precisely, when the Allegro Molto e con Brio starts, the left hand always performs this uh, figure. Now, the more slowly you play those eighth notes, the more you have the opportunity to really focus on the single note, also in terms of articulation. And the faster you play it, the more it becomes just a general tremulando. So I decided to look for some sort of middle path between the two uh, extremes to choose a tempo that gives the impression of speed, of being fast, of agitation once again, but still give me the opportunity to put energy into the single eighth notes. And I think it goes very well together with uh, the right hand. just adds this energy from the bass, which I find very lovely. It also allows to bring out the poetic quality of the second th uh, theme, with its melancholy, which is quite wonderful in that tempo. Moving on to the third movement, here something else comes uh, into play. When we look at the melody, we see it goes to the third first. Yeah, then it goes back to the second D and then to the C. Yeah, something quite sorrowful, also something very singing. Then it goes to the fifth. To the sixth. Yeah, fifth. Yeah, and then. It goes back from the third to uh, the C. And to me, once again, that's a very melancholic character, which I like to bring out. If I play that after Carl Czerny's metronome marking, the way we understand it today, it would sound like that. I don't feel much of that poetic melancholy in such a tempo. This changes when I slow it down. So I think it suits uh, that movement very well like that. Okay, that brings me to Opus 90. I would like to say something uh, only about the second uh, movement. By the way, I use uh, the original list edition for the, all of the three sonatas which came out in the 1850s and also has some nice little stuff about articulation, which is very interesting and inspiring. Okay, so the second movement in German, uh, as a movement name, says nicht zu geschwind und sehr singbar vorgetragen, which means not too fast and very singing. In the list edition, we also find a metronome marking, uh, quarter note 92. If I play it like that, uh, it would sound like this. If I listen to this, I would say it's at least an andante con moto, but probably uh, more of an allegretto. Now, the interesting thing is that uh, for this movement, there is also just 
a very little <laughs> a document, a very little information, but important information that we find from Liszt's masterclasses. This time it's August Göllerich, who says that on July 4th, 1884, this piece was performed uh, within Liszt's master classes. And he says uh, it was Opus 90, the first movement and the Adagio. So he calls the second movement an Adagio. Why did he, did he do that? I, I'm just speculating here, but still, uh, it's possible to make some conclusions. Either Liszt himself called it an adagio, or it sounded like an adagio, which means the tempo would have been significantly slower, something like that. Which is just so beautiful. It almost sounds like Schubert uh, in, in this way, and I just think it's, it's very, very beautiful, and I could easily imagine that Franz Liszt actually performed it that way. As these examples show, this volume 7 of the Atempo project is all about the benefits of a slower interpretation, <clears throat> a slower approach to classical music. It's about the clarity of articulation, the singing quality of melodies, and the general intensity of musical figures. What you will hear is an interpretation inspired by records of slowness in the 19th century. And with this, I wish you a lot of pleasure and joy with these three wonderful Beethoven piano sonatas. Thank you very much.